TV English, the solution for humanity. Do you know what Islam is? It's a way of life for all. It is taught in the Quran, a big and small. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life. A complete way. Do you know what Islam says? It says that life's the greatest. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown coming to you with another episode. We have been discussing the evidence to support the claim of the Holy Quran as divine revelation from Allah. So. We have worked our way through the first three evidences. We are now upon the evidence of the relation of revelation to contemporaneous events. In other words, the events that occurred at the time that the Holy Quran was being revealed. The next evidence would be the relation of the revelation to subsequent events, that which happened after the revelation, and then after that, the relation of the revelation to the unknown, what was unknown during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, I will begin by pointing out that these three sections cover nearly 30 pages in my book, Got It, this one here. Um, there's no way that I can get through that in 25 minutes. However, there's every way that you can get through it if you choose to read it. But to give a taste for what you will find there, evidence number four for the Holy Quran being indeed holy, being divine revelation, is the relation of the revelation to contemporary events. In other words, the relation of the Quran to events that unfolded at the time that the Quran was being revealed. Now, I will begin by saying what is significant here is not only what happened and what was recorded, but what happened and what was not recorded. Because we see in the Holy Quran that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived through a period in excess of 20 years where he was bearing the revelation, a period in which he was suffering in many ways and traumatized and experiencing all kinds of assaults upon his person, character, the believers, and so on. And yet there are many things which we would expect to find mentioned in a book written by a human being which in fact are not mentioned at all. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was married for 25 years to Khadija. After 25 years of love, support, caring, etc., she passed away. After 25 years in which she was his wife and his only wife, he remained married to her and to her alone during their marriage, she passed away. Now, in a human book, we would expect somebody to mention at least once the wife who he loved so much and who he lost to his great sorrow. And yet, we do not find Khadija mentioned anywhere in the Holy Quran. As a matter of fact, we do not find his wives mentioned once. We do not find his daughters, his sons mentioned a single time. In fact, we do not find his father mentioned. We do not find his mother mentioned. We do not find his sons or daughters mentioned a single time. If we look for the one woman who is mentioned in glowing terms in the Holy Quran, it is not his wives or one of his wives. It is not his mother. It is Mary, the mother of Jesus. The one woman in the Holy Quran who is really mentioned in glowing terms to whom an entire chapter is entitled, the chapter, the surah, the surah Maryam, is about Maryam, the mother of Jesus. This is not something we would expect as an element of human methodology. Similarly, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bestowed great care upon certain aspects of his person. For example, it is recorded that he brushed his teeth a minimum of five times a day and taught his disciples to do the same. He was fastidious about this level of his care. 
And so, again, we would expect him to mention it in the Quran if, indeed, he had written it himself. But it is nowhere mentioned. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam professed that for every disease there is a cure. So again, were he the author, we would expect there to be a cookbook of home remedies, and yet there is not. The only mention of any form of remedy is the mention of healing in honey, about which we know to be true. So we find that the Holy Quran does not present the human qualities we would expect from a revelation claimed to be a revelation but written by a man. In fact, we find the Holy Quran possesses the qualities we would expect of a book of revelation in that it does not dwell upon the specific issues of the life of the messenger. It dwells upon the message. Another thing that we find in the Holy Quran that we might expect not to find is there are actually some passages which speak about things Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam probably would have preferred not to have spoken of. In one occasion in Surah 80, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is admonished by Allah for turning his back on a blind man who came seeking some words of advice, whereas Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was involved in a conversation that he preferred because he was speaking with some of the wealthy and powerful members of the Quraysh. And so he turned his back on the blind man, and for this Allah admonished him in Scripture. Would a charlatan, would a man who is a false prophet admonish himself in Scripture and reveal his misjudgment? Okay, it's not a great sin, perhaps. That is for Allah to measure, Allah who alam, Allah knows best, but it is a misjudgment. We might say from our judgment, it is not a big thing, but still it is a fault, enough so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonished him for it. And would a charlatan have admitted such an admonishing to his followers if he were the one writing the book of Revelation? Of course not. A charlatan is trying to paint himself perfect. And yet we find in the Holy Quran that not a detail is left out, not even the admonishing of the prophet when it is a lesson to be learned, not only by the Prophet, but by his followers for all time. We find that similarly, Allah admonished Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for forbidding himself the use of honey. When a trick was played upon him to make him believe that the honey gave his breath a bad odor, so he forbade himself the use of honey. And Allah admonished him for this. A small thing, perhaps, but large enough that Allah saw to reveal the admonishment. And significant in that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not cover it, hide it. But as you would expect of a true prophet, revealed what, or transmitted what he was in charge to reveal. We find in another passage that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was admonished for praying for forgiveness of the hypocrites. These were men who were denied the mercy of Allah due to their obstinate rebellion. And although it demonstrates a beautiful facet of Muhammad's character, peace be upon him, the fact that he would pray for the forgiveness even of the hypocrites, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrects this element of his behavior because it was not appropriate. We find that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was admonished for directing his adopted son to keep his marriage when divorce was preferable. This was a passage that was so embarrassing to him that Aisha, his, one of his wives, later commented to effect that, quote, were Muhammad to have concealed anything from the revelation, he would have concealed this verse. And yet he didn't. As much as he would have liked to have concealed this verse, he exemplified what we would expect of a true prophet. He revealed revelation in its entirety, even in those aspects which showed his misjudgment. So here is a man who claimed every letter of revelation to being from God and who included those passages that corrected his own errors. Indeed, he included passages 
which directed him to repent. So we find in this the example of a very divine book conveyed by a very human prophet. Evidence number five, revelation and its relation to subsequent events. In other words, the Holy Quran and events that followed after the completion of the revelation. In one example, we find in the Holy Quran, in Surah 54, verses 43 to 45, the prediction that the Muslims would, would gain victory in battle over the pagan Quraysh. Now, this was, this was revealed at a time when the Muslims were weak, persecuted, and few in number. So startling was this verse that it is reported in some tradition that Omar, upon reading this, actually, actually questioned, which group will we defeat? Because it was almost inconceivable that this weak and persecuted group would defeat anyone. However, at the Battle of Badr, the Muslims did indeed defeat the Quraysh, and both sides, both the Muslims and the Quraysh, testified to having seen angels fighting on the side of the Muslims. The Muslims achieved victory, although they were outnumbered four to one, although the Quraysh had cavalry and they did not. The Quraysh had superior arms and body protection in the form of mail. They did not. All the same, the foretold uh, victory came to pass. We're going to take a break right now. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Islam is a way of life, a complete the best 10 days of our life. And proclaim the pilgrimage among men. They will come to thee on foot and mounted on every camel. Lean on account of journeys through deep and distant mountain highways. A unique opportunity to get closer to Allah. To learn more, follow the upcoming series on the virtues of the first 10 days of Learn how we can draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these days which are full of blessings and great rewards in the virtues of the first 10 days of Zul Hijjah every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 11 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. UK on Peace TV. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing this episode and we are discussing the evidences for the divine revelation of the Holy Quran. We are discussing the relation of the Holy Quran with events that occurred after specific revelations. Basically, these are prophetic passages, passages which foretell an event occurring. Now, as with all of the sections, I, I apologize for giving a rather superficial discussion, not covering the topic in entirety, but to do that would be to write books on camera and we cannot do that. However, I will pick out my favorite passages, and in the context of this issue, my favorite issue actually is that in Surah 111, the condemnation of Abu Lahab and his wife to the hellfire is foretold. Allah tells us of the condemnation of Abu Lahab and his wife to the hellfire. Now, let's put ourselves into the picture. Abu Lahab was a hater of the man Muhammad and the religion of Islam. He contradicted everything that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam did or said. If Muhammad said day, he would say night. If he said 
left, he would say right. If he said black, he would say white. He would say everything opposite to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just to try to destroy the revelation and to convince people not to follow his teachings. This was his way. His way was to contradict absolutely everything Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed in revelation. And yet Surah 111 predicted his condemnation to the hellfire. How are these two things contradictory? They're contradictory because in the creed of the Muslim, if you repent, you will be in paradise. Abu Lahab and his wife lived after this revelation. At any time during that period, all they had to do was stand up and say, I repent. All they had to do was take the Shahada and pretend to become Muslim, not even actually do it. Just pretend to become Muslim. And in the hearts of the believers, he would have contradicted the Quran and he would have destroyed the belief in the hearts of the people and disrupted the religion, which was exactly his purpose. That was exactly what he devoted his life to doing, to trying to tear down the religion. No doubt there were friends and associates who tried to goad him into it. Hey, Abu Lahab, you know, to his wife, the same thing. We've been told that you are condemned to hellfire. Look, just go out there and just tell people, I repent. Say the words and you will destroy him. And in five and ten years, respectively, for Abu Lahab and his wife, neither one of them did it. Why? In the creed of the Muslim, no words can ever pass your mouth if Allah forbids it. As much as this man wanted to destroy the religion of Islam, he could not even bring these words to his lips, even with all of his friends pushing him to do so. Similarly, we have Al-Walid ibn al mughira who verses of the Quran condemn him as well, an avowed enemy to Islam, again lived out his entire life, refusing to say the words, although that would have disrupted the revelation. Why is it that these great enemies of Islam refuse to take this very simple step? It, is, it would be against human methodology to put together a revelation in this fashion. It would be against human methodology to say, look, if you repent, you will be in paradise. But you know what? These people over here, these complete enemies of the religion, they'll never repent. For the next five, ten years, for the rest of their lives, they will never repent. No human, no charlatan would ever say such a thing because with a few words, these people could destroy everything that charlatan had built of a false faith. But you know what? If it was a true faith, and if the commandments were from God, it makes perfect sense. If you presume all of this to be from a man, it makes absolutely no sense, because no human being would ever put everything that he has worked for on the line when he knows the evil character of these people to begin with, and the fact that all they had to do was stand up and say, I believe and you would have destroyed everything you worked for. Many more examples in this chapter, but we need to skip forward. I'm going to pass on to the final evidence that I want to discuss, which is the revelation of the unknown. A better title for this perhaps might be scientific evidence. Under the title of scientific evidence, we find many things spoken of in the Holy Quran, which embody or which describe things about which there was no knowledge until modern day. Now, as with the previous section, which was the relation of the Holy Quran to contemporaneous events, to events occurring during the time or after the revelation, in the case of the revelation of the unknown, with both of these sections, we find something truly fascinating. And that is, we do not find any instance where Allah predicted something that did not come to pass, or where Allah has spoken of something that we can now disprove. In fact, every prediction made in the Holy Quran has, to our knowledge, come true. Or, in fact, when Allah speaks of things matters of knowledge, 
every, in every single instance, we have come to understand these things in modern times, or at the very minimum, those things that were spoken of cannot be assailed with modern knowledge. So, we might use as an example the fact that Allah spoke of, and as I'm flipping here, you can see exactly, you know, roughly how much of a discussion I go into of this, but Allah spoke of, for example, elements of geology, where he described the mountains in a manner that can only be considered as having a visible portion above and a deep extension beneath. We now know that a mountain of maybe one mile in height might have 10 miles of root underneath. Creation of the universe, where the universe is described in terms that can only be understood in terms of the Big Bang. Continental drift, a concept that was not known until modern times. The heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon, described in terms of the sun being a source of light, the moon being reflected light. Celestial movement in terms of rotation and rounded orbits. Physiology, including the concept of all living things being made predominantly from water. There are passages which speak of everything from the inner workings of the body in certain respects, we, we derive from these teachings an understanding of many things with regard to not only our embryology, but our persons and our environment. The water cycle, the atmosphere, and, and many, many other issues are discussed in a matter that are basically irrefutable. Even down to alluding to the distinctive aspect of fingerprints the uniqueness of a fingerprint. And the point is that in all of this, in all of this, what we find are two things. Two concepts dominate. Number one, the exclusivity of this material, the beauty of the revelation in that it describes things that no man could possibly have known 1,400 years ago that have only come to be known in the context of modern knowledge, and that we cannot conceive any possibility of, of having been known previous to that. At the same time, the second point is that these, or this represents a body of knowledge that does not have any demonstrable defects. Considering the breadth and the depth of knowledge that is exposed in the Holy Quran, we would expect, had this book been authored by a man, we would expect to find something that was not true or had not come true. And yet, we do not encounter this. We do not find this anywhere in the Holy Quran. Now, all of you, or I should say most of you, know that I am a convert to Islam. I have written extensively about my experience I have written extensively about my studies of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I have described in this series my conversion from atheism to a religious search that took me through the monotheistic religions, down the chain of continuity of revelation from Judaism to Christianity to Islam, from an examination of the Old Testament to the New Testament to being convinced in the divine revelation of the Holy Quran. And yet, none of that is going to replace each person's individual investigation and study of the scriptures and of the, you know, of the prophets. I encourage everybody out there to do what I did. Turn to our Creator with sincerity. Recognize Him. Because if you do not recognize him, why should he recognize you? Recognize him. Pray to him for guidance with sincerity. Ask for him to open your heart and your mind to the religion of truth, to guide you thereupon, and don't forget this, and to make it easy for you 
and to make you pleased with it and to bless you thereupon. Allah is the most merciful. Should he answer your prayer, which we fully expect if you are sincere and you turn to him with repentance and piety, if he answers the completeness of your prayer, not only will he guide you to the religion of truth, but he will make you pleased thereupon. I'm not saying you won't face a period of trial, but with the blessings of Allah, you will prove your sincerity through any period of trial that you prevail upon, and Allah will grant you victory in this life, in your religion, and, inshallah, in the hereafter. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, concluding this episode and bidding everybody out there peace. Do you know what Islam is? It's a way of life for all. It is taught in the Quran for big and small. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life. A complete way. Do you know what Islam says? It says that life's the greatest test. It says that life. The solution for humanity. Peace in you, peace in me, peace for everybody. Fresh, pure, pure holy peace. Peace in you, peace in me, peace for everybody. Fresh, pure, pure holy peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you. And welcome to the 22nd segment of the series, Peace and Justice for All. In the previous segment, we were just giving a basic background of the presence of Jewish people in Yathrib, which later became Medina, after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrated to that city. Now, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions were still in Mecca, suffering all kinds of persecution, some people who used to come for pilgrimage, because the Arabs kept the tradition of pilgrimage since Ishmael, but added some idolatrous element to it. But it originated from Ishmael, not from the Arabs. But they just changed it. So they used to still to respect the Kaaba, and they were proud to be the descendants of Abraham, even though they didn't follow his monotheistic teaching. And as it happened in many cases, some of those people who came to inquire about Islam, in spite of all of the pressure applied on them by the, uh, by the Meccans, were able to hear the message of Islam, and some accepted Islam. But when they went back, Islam began to spread in Medina. And the reputation and personality of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was known already among all people that he is a peace seeker and also a peacemaker. Even before he was a prophet, he acted in more than one occasion as a peacemaker. With that reputation, the following 